Very pleased to welcome back to the show Don Violo, TimingTheMarket.ca. Don, appreciate you finding time for us on the weekend here. Yeah, thanks for having me back, uh, Mike. Well, there's always so much to talk about. And it's you know what's funny? And I know that Grant had contacted you. But after he had already contacted you, I phoned him to see, can you get Don on with me? <laughs> and the reason is, I mean, partially it's the time of year. I just had... Uh, Neil McIver remind us of that old expression, you know, sell, sell in May and come back some other time in the fall. I just want to get your perspective, first of all, on the general markets and, and where we're at with those. Yeah, historically, that has been the pattern that historically there's something that happens in the summertime which causes markets to go into a corrective phase. Uh, this year, it's a little bit different in North American markets. We've actually seen the peak of the U.S. markets on March the 1st. And for the TSX composite, it was actually on February the 23rd. So we've gone to a corrective phase a little bit earlier than we normally uh, would expect. That's not unusual, particularly during years when you have a new Republican president uh, who's coming into power. Historically, markets have a difficult time right through until usually uh, September of October of that, uh, that particular year. So that's not unusual. After saying that, one of the things mentioned during the uh, – the uh, World Outlook Financial Conference in January was that, you know, there are other markets other than North American markets, and these other markets have been doing very, very well. The one I mentioned at uh, the uh, conference was the the Frontier ETF, symbol is FM. Uh, that's basically it's an emerging markets ETF. It actually hit a new two-year high on Wednesday of this week. So there are markets out there that you can invest other than North America, and still make a nice profit. Uh, let me just backtrack just for a sec. I mean, this is the first year in a presidential cycle. I mean, how much credence should we put in that kind of stuff? How consistent or how predictive is the when you start looking at cyclicality in that way? Yeah, historically, uh, when you have a new president coming into power, uh, things are kind of rocky right through, at least until uh, May of, of the, that uh, year after the election. And we're seem to be following that pattern pretty closely this time. Uh, just during the last few days, we've seen a number of major equity indices in North America trip below their 50-day moving averages, uh, most notably the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the NASDAQ, and then yesterday, the TSX Composite. Now, historically, when that happens on a technical basis, markets have a difficult time for at least a period of time. In fact, there was a study released yesterday showing that on average, when the S&P 500 drops below the 50-day moving average, the uh, S&P 500 on average drops by 1% during the first five trading days and then approximately 1% after 30 trading days. So we're into this period of sloppy markets. Nothing seriously bad, but sloppy markets, just the same. I'm talking with Don Vialo, timingthemarket.ca. Uh, Don, let me just put some of these things together. So you've got the presidential cycle. I'm just wondering uh, for us how to how to use these kind of tools. So you have the presidential cycle, as you just said. Uh, you know, you sort of expect it now to sort of turn around, uh, you know, into May. But then you do have the cyclicality that sells you that, as you alluded to right off the top, you know, sell in May and, and come back after it snows or whatever. You know. sure. what's, that, what's that expression again, Don? Yeah, the one I like using is buy when it snows, sell when it goes. Of course, I realize it doesn't entirely fit Vancouver, but uh, I was going to say that fits. We've been buying like crazy, <laughs> but uh, so okay. So we've got that sort of level of cyclicality coming on board at that point, and then you see the the technical stuff that you're looking at in the market, as you say, breaking below 50-day moving averages. Do you put that all together and say, you know what, I'm going to back off. I, I maybe I'm taking some profit in this market. I'm going to get some cash going. Yeah, that's a good strategy. Uh... You know, you've got a couple of positive things happening in the next little while. Things like the earnings reports in the first quarter should be very good. But you also got the other factor, and we hear it in the news, virtually every newscast, and that's uh, geopolitical uncertainty. Things like Korea, things like Venezuela, Syria, Afghanistan, France. There's all kinds of uh, geopolitical uncertainties going on right now. And the uncertainty seem to be overcoming the possible positive news coming from, say, first quarter earnings reports. 
Well, I think that French election is going to be very interesting. It's been all over the map because there's been so many scandals there. So, you know, the front weather, Mr. Filion, you know, I mean, you know, he's been paying his wife and children for doing no work. I mean, that was a corruption scandal that, you know, derailed his campaign. Uh, you get the movement in the last couple of weeks of the communist candidate, and then you get Marie Le Pen, uh, you know, certainly anti-EU, uh, anti the open refugee policy. You know, the list just goes on. The socialists are completely discredited under Francois Hollande, which is why he's not running. Uh, that that seems to me a level of uncertainty the EU can't can't afford at this point. Yes, that election uh, at the end of next week is going to be watched very very closely. If Le Pen wins, and there's a pretty good chance she will, she's yeah. the far-right candidate, then that's going to create some, should we say, turbulence in European equity markets. No, no question about that. And then we'll talk about, of course, in the French, you know, they have the, the, the first set of elections, and then they take the top two and run them off, which might be a different result. But, I mean, it's still going to be interesting there. Let me look within the industry groups then. You know, when you look at, uh, you know, so that's the broad brush there. Uh, give me a, can you give me an example of a couple of groups that are coming into favor and maybe a couple, maybe, yeah, actually, let's start with this. A couple of groups that are going out of favor. I'll have to take a break then. We'll come back and talk about a couple that are coming into favor. Sure. When I was in Vancouver at the end of January, I favored the base metal sector. And at that time, the uh, sector was in, in gear, doing very, very well. Uh, but the technicals uh, for that sector, which normally are positive from January to April, started turning negative a lot sooner than normal. Uh, historically, the sector does peak in early April. This year, it actually peaked around the middle of uh, February. After that, the, the sector started to underperform. Uh, they dropped below their 20-day moving averages. Momentum started to turning down. We saw copper prices, for example, completing head and shoulders patterns on the charts last week. Uh, a number of important base metal stocks like Rio Tinto, Alcoa, and, and Vail all broke key support levels last week. So that sector is no longer in favor and should not be held at current prices. Uh, I'm going to take a break, Don Vialo. I'll talk about a trade that Don introduced me to, gosh, it's years ago, and it worked out about six or seven consecutive years since he told me. And then he said, not this year. I'll chat with him about that when we come back right here on the Money Talks Network. You can always go to timingthemarket.ca and find Don Vialo, but you can also, we're very pleased to say, he's been a regular friend of this show. Uh, terrific stuff with Don. Hey, Don, I just want to remind you, take a walk down memory lane. I don't even know, I was thinking during the break, I don't know if this is like six, seven, eight years ago, you told me and we told our listeners about the wholesale gasoline trade, and it proceeded to work out, I think, eight consecutive years, but I love this. The last time you are on this show, you told me, you're not so sure about this year, so I held off. You know, it's it's just fascinating. Just elaborate a little bit more on that trade for us and why you weren't as keen this year. Hey, Mike, it's happening again. Oh, is it? Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Historically, gasoline prices move higher from early February right through until mid-June. And just like the Canadian energy sector in general, it got out to a really slow start this year. We didn't get a, uh, any kind of a technical showing of the seasonality coming in until approximately the middle of March, about a month ago. Mm-hmm. And then it really clicked in. Uh, I'm not sure what the price of gasoline is in uh, downtown Vancouver, but I know in Toronto here, during the past two weeks, the price of gasoline has gone up 10 cents per liter. So, boy, the seasonality is clicking in big time, uh, probably right across the country. It's typical this is a time of year when there's problems with uh, production of gasoline uh, because of changing over at refineries. Uh, also, there has been very strong demand for gasoline this year, and that certainly uh, had a positive impact on that trade. So if you're in gasoline, uh, there's an ETF for that. The symbol is UGA. Just by owning UGA, you own gasoline futures, essentially. And that trade is clicking in very, very nicely once again. So is it still on, so we can go ahead and uh, have a look at that? Obviously, everything always depends on what someone's portfolio is, what their risk parameters. I'm just saying, are you giving the, uh, am I too late, I guess is what I should say. No, you're still, you're still in, the, in the groove, so to speak. You still have until mid-June on the trade. And uh, at that point in time, then it's the time to take some nice profits in, the, in gasoline. 
No, I mean, obviously the past isn't a guarantee of the future and all of that stuff. But, boy, this this is one I'm very familiar with the, the trade. And this is one that has really been consistent. And, and maybe it's because they have to switch over. You know, we know they already that sometime in April they start that switching over in refineries from, you know, the winter grade to the summer grade, although it seems some days that winter's never leaving us. But they still do it, you know, which cuts down on supply. And as you say, the demand side seems to be pretty strong this year. But it's it's been a very reliable kind of seasonal trade, which uh, to me exemplifies the kinds, one of the tools that you use is looking at seasonality this way. Yes, I guess the, uh, the oil companies say, okay, this is when we switch from winter gas to summer gas and there's extra costs involved, but that's part of their marketing program. The, mm-hmm. the key is seasonality it does seem to work pretty consistently right around this time of year. Uh, a related sector is the Canadian energy sector, which is also has similar kinds of seasonality normally from the end of January to mid-June. That also clicked in late this year and didn't really click in until around the middle of uh, March this year. And it happened in a kind of a strange sort of way. Uh, I'm not saying that all Canadian energy stocks are looking good right now, even though they're all in their period of seasonal strength. It's the gassy stocks, the natural gas stocks, which are really clicking in and are starting to show much better performance than the oily stocks. So stocks like Encana, Advantage, Birch Cliff, these are all stocks which are heavily sensitive towards the price of natural gas. And natural gas has a period of seasonal strength right from, uh, right from mid-March right through until mid-June. So we're in the period of seasonal strength for natural gas as well as for gassy stocks. It's such a fascinating thing, though, because, uh, as you say, you can see these patterns. And when you look at these things and you see these sort of patterns, these uh, annual patterns, Uh, For example, I know that you've uh, made us a lot of money over the past looking at gold seasonal pattern because it's it's had a pretty high probability. What kind of level of probability or consistency when you say 7 out of 10 years or is it 8 out of 10 years before you sort of make it, uh, you know, incorporate that in decision making? Yeah, 7 out of 10 years is a pretty good uh, benchmark to use. Sometimes it can be higher or slightly lower, but uh, that's kind of like a minimum you want to use. Mm -hmm. And that certainly has worked again this year. Uh, For example, uh, Silver, platinum, and palladium are, all had periods of seasonal strength from approximately the middle of December right through until the middle of April. Well, we're now at the middle of April, and they've all done very well, and now's the time to reconsider that trade, possibly take some money off the table. Again, which group is that? Which with specific silver and what else? Silver, platinum, and palladium. Silver okay. we just broke out last week, and palladium is very, very close to its, its high uh, platinum, not as much, but they all have, have performed very, very well since the middle of December when the period of seasonal strength uh, was ended. It's such a fascinating thing because when I look at the technicals at silver, for example, as you say, it broke out last week. Uh, you know, is that the time to sell then? Or, or, or how influential, or how influenced you in your decision-making are by the seasonality of it? Yeah, what you want to do when you get to the end of a period of seasonal strength is look at the technicals and do you still see the uh, commodity or security moving higher on a momentum basis? Is it still trending above its 20-day moving average? Uh, what are the momentum indicators in particular telling you? In this particular case, uh, all these are starting to, in the case of uh, platinum and palladium, are starting to show signs of rolling over. Silver, not so much. It actually just broke out last week. So what you want to do is just watch the charts very, very closely. There's nothing magic about April the 15th, but you know, on average, that's the date when you want to start uh, mm-hmm. taking money off the table. So, so it, in it, all of these cases, yeah. uh, you can stick with them for a little bit longer, but you're looking for technical signs, particularly short-term momentum signs, that they have reached their peak and are starting to roll over. We've only got a couple of uh, minutes left on, so I've got to ask you about gold. Yeah, gold actually is interesting because... It actually has a period from middle of December right through until the end of February. And we certainly we saw that pretty well this year. It actually peaked out around the third week in, in February this year. Had a little bit of correction, and now it's come back. It actually did break out again last week. That's outside of its period of seasonal strength. That has everything to do with what's happening with the geopolitical situation in the world. Uh, when you get more uncertainty about geopolitics, that means that gold prices are going to move higher. So for now, forgetting the seasonality and just looking at the technicals, gold still looks okay, but it is outside of its period of seasonal strength, so be aware of that as well. You know, it's 
so I, I guess we have to sum up in a minute, which is a little short. But uh, so right now you've got, uh, you know, as you say, gold and uh, silver on your sort of, uh, you know, alert. Be alert on that one chart. Uh, the overall market, you're also adding that into that when they, you know, as you say, we're looking back. That looks like the intermediate highs have been made. So that's another reason there. So I'm sort of feeling a bit cautious at this point. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good assessment. Uh, let me give you one that's kind of like off the radar screen that might be of interest to your listeners, and that's uranium and uranium stocks. The yeah. uranium prices seem to have bottomed during the last few weeks, and we're starting to see uranium stocks outperform the market. And their period of seasonal strength actually starts uh, April 15th and goes right through until at least the middle of, uh, of June and can go higher. As always, John, Don, it's just so fascinating. And people, though, don't have to wait to hear you on Money Talks. They can still go to timingthemarket.ca and get the latest from Don Bielo. Don, as always, I, I really appreciate you finding time for us. Uh, to go out and enjoy the rest of the long weekend, you've made ours a little more enjoyable. Thanks, Mike. It's been a pleasure.